how many of you either has a food allergy or know someone who has a food allergy? Yeah, lots of hands. So when I was a kid, my brothers and I ate peanut butter and jelly almost every day for lunch. By the time my kids got to elementary school, their classrooms were peanut free. And food allergies have become an enormous problem in the US and other developed countries. It's now estimated that 15 million Americans suffer from food allergies. Some of these are life-threatening. So they, it seems to present as, as two types of diseases. Um, one of the presentations involves a, a food allergy that develops between ages two and five and resolves on its own. And the other is a lifelong, life-threatening allergic response to food that can send someone to the emergency room uh, every three minutes in the US. So we now have two children in every classroom with food allergies. How do we account for this kind of change in just a generation? So that, that's the question that we're trying to tackle. And our hypothesis is that it's due to changes in what we call the microbiota. That is all of the bacteria that live in and on our bodies. So in the video, you might remember we, I mentioned that we are 99% microbial. There are trillions of bacteria living in our intestines that are as yet very poorly understood and control many physiological processes and have a particular impact on the development and function of the immune system. So we're suggesting that what's happened, this, what's caused this generational change is lifestyle practices that have changed the composition of these bacteria. So what are some of these? They're depicted here. The biggest offender by far is antibiotic use. It's estimated that children in the United States have six courses of antibiotics before they're two years old, most of them for viral infections for which antibiotics serve no purpose. We also have extensive exposure to antibiotics subclinically. So you may not know that for 50 years, um, uh, farmers have, have had a practice where they've given their livestock subclinical doses of antibiotics because they knew that that made the livestock fatter and, and more valuable. And um, some have suggested that we've done that same experiment to ourselves and that that's what's driving the epidemic of obesity in this country. So I should mention that we study particularly food allergy, but food allergy is appearing as part of a constellation of diseases that are sometimes called the diseases of Western lifestyle. And they include inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, food allergy, diabetes, autism, asthma, all of which are increasing in parallel. Another major offender is diet. So we've co-evolved with our microbiota over millennia. And as we've heard a little bit about, um, the, our ancestors were not consuming McDonald's. So the diet has changed and our bacteria are eat what we eat. And their food source has changed in a way that's changed them seemingly for, for the worse. We've also eliminated previously common enteropathogens. Vaccination had reduced exposure to infectious disease has also changed the composition of our microbiome. And here I want to be very clear that I'm not in any way suggesting that vaccination is not the greatest public health success story in history. But what I am suggesting is that vaccine, you know that being infected with something uh, elicits a very different response than receiving a vaccine against it. The immune system sees them in two different ways. And finally, cesarean birth and formula feedings. And I want to take a little bit of time with that. So we're sterile prior to birth, and the co-evolved strategy is vaginal delivery. That's how we get our founder microbiota. And the microbiota that we um, inherit from our mother's vaginal tract has an, a relationship that evolves over time uh, over an ecological succession between the mother and the mother's interaction with the baby and breastfeeding. That whole um, naturally involved interaction is disturbed by cesarean section birth. And it's been shown that babies born by C-section are instead, their initial founder bacteria can be tracked to the skin of their mother or their caregiver. 
cesarean birth is associated with higher risk of, of allergic disease, higher susceptibility to pathogens. Early childhood is what we study as the window of opportunity. This is when all of the changes in the immune system are taking place and when it's most susceptible to intervention but also most susceptible to, to damage. And the bacterial populations are changing rapidly. They're very un unstable. But over time, each individual develops their own unique microbiota that possibly changes again when they become elderly. Um, our, the bacteria that live in our gut have a, also a very important role in digesting our food. So many of the common dietary fibers that we ingest are, in fact, insoluble to us without help from these bacteria that ferment them into products that are essential for our, our health. Among, prominent among these are the short-chain fatty acids, and we're particularly interested in, in one of these called butyrate that it serves as a critical energy source for the epithelial cells that line our digestive tract and also has other functions for the immune system. So how do we begin to address a problem of understanding which bacterial populations are important for regulating allergic responses to food? We're lucky that here at the University of Chicago, we have access to state-of-the-art germ-free mouse facilities. So germ-free mouse means that, that we can raise mice so that they're never exposed to any bacteria at all. They live inside these bubbles. So these white um, things hanging down, these are actually gloves. These are the fingers of the gloves. So in order to work with the mice that are living in here for their entire lives, you have to stick your hands through these gloves and manipulate the mice within these cages. That system allows us to select bacterial populations that we can introduce into the mice specifically and look at how those bacterial populations interact with the immune system. But as I mentioned, we know very little about the microbiota as yet. So how to approach this? What we decided to do was to divide the whole world of intestinal bacteria. And these are thousands of different species many of which are obligate anaerobes. That means that they can't grow when they're exposed to oxygen. So they can't be cultured in, in test tubes. And we know them mostly by their genetic information, by their sequences. So what we decided to do was to compare the, so this is a depiction of the epithelial surface, to compare the bacteria that live in association with the mucus layer two bacteria that are free-floating with the digestive food and see if we could get some insight into which of those populations might be important. And in the course of those studies, we did identify a particular population of mucosa-associated bacteria called the clostridia that protected against an, um, allergic sensitization to food. And what we found that it does is that it regulates the function of the epithelial lining that, of our digestive tract in a way that increases the production of mucus and increases the production of natural antibiotics, antimicrobial peptides, so it has a barrier protective effect. So then we wanted to apply this to the development of novel therapeutics to prevent or treat food allergy. So to begin to do that, we collaborated with a group in Italy that had done a, a large-scale study examining dietary management of children with cow's milk allergy. And what our collaborator did was to compare, so these are children that come into his clinic with cow's milk allergy, and he put them onto different formulas to see what was most effective at managing their disease. And what he found was that when he gave them a formula that was supplemented with a conventional probiotic, Lactobacillus GG, so this is the probiotic bacteria that's present uh, all through whole foods or the, and the, that is contained in, in yogurt, um, he found that those children had a greater rate of acquisition of tolerance to cow's milk after 12 months of treatment. So he gave us fecal samples from children that received this diet and also that received a diet without LGG. And what we found 
was that the children that had cow's milk allergy, this is at four months of age, had a bacterial population that looked entirely different from that in the healthy children. It had more diversity. It looked like the bacterial population of adults, as if it had gone through its maturation in, at warp speed. And that was very surprising to us. And we found what's showing you here is that it was more diverse, and even though the amount of bacteria present was the same. And particularly, what we noticed when we compared samples before and after treatment is that the children that received the formula that was associated with the acquisition of tolerance had high levels of butyric acid, that short-chain fatty acid that I told you was important for intestinal health that's produced by the fermentation of dietary fiber. They had much more of that in, detectable in their feces after treatment. So this leads to a picture. This is a, a, a schematic that was published um, in Nature and Scientific American last year, which suggests that there are populations of bacteria, including the Clostridia or another bacteria called Fecobacterium prasnitzi, that act to digest dietary fiber and produce butyrate to increase populations of immune system cells. I also told you about this barrier protective cy cytokine IL-22. And all of this is important for maintaining a healthy barrier, an intact mucus layer. But in the absence of what this author called the bacterial peacekeepers, you have a depleted mucus layer, more access of toxins and foods into the into the body, into the circulation, more chance for disease. So how can we use this information to begin to develop treatments for food allergy? The way we decided to approach this was to take the fecal material from healthy infants or from allergic infants and put them into these germ-free mice and then sensitize them with a cow's milk protein. So the idea being that these mice would be non-allergic, they'd be protected, and these mice would become allergic. And we got this really mind-boggling result. So the, what I'm showing you here is that here in red are the mice that are, are colonized with the healthy infant's bacteria. Here in gray are mice that are colonized with the allergic infant's bacteria. And what we're looking at is a change in gore, core body temperature. So when somebody goes into anaphylaxis, their core body temperature drops. And I, I think you can, you can readily appreciate if your core body temperature drops 8 degrees, that's a big problem. And these mice di are dying of anaphylaxis. So what's amazing here is that all we've given to the mice is the fecal material of those infants. And we've recapitulated the clinical phenotype. So we found then an atopic microbiome a microbiome that creates an allergic response. And I emphasize that all we're giving to these mice, that what's killing them is milk protein. That's all. So this then gives us a platform that we can use to screen potential therapeutics. And we formed a company on campus to do this. And some of the candidates are mixtures of bacteria that are identified by our sequence analysis a uh, prebiotic dietary fibers, that is bacterial uh, fibers that have been selected specifically to expand the butyrate producing uh, clostridia, working in conjunction with a carbohydrate chemist. And finally, nanoformulations of butyrate working with um, the uh, collaborator at the Institute for Molecular Engineering. So I'll just uh, end by thanking all of the people and funding sources that have contributed to this work. Is a long-range potential use of what you did with the mice applicable to newborns who are born by cesarean section as a way of preventing them from getting allergy? Uh, so uh, one stra particular strategy that other people are pursuing, uh, not us, is to actually take vaginal swabs from mothers of cesarean babies and use those use that to, to inoculate, the, the inoculate the baby's mouth 
as, as they might have been had they been delivered vaginally. Because our, the children that are coming into our study have already got this altered microbiota at four months of age. It's already too late. So it, um, that's one approach that other groups are taking to address that issue. Are there any results from that? A very small study so far shows that, that it has some efficacy in colonizing those babies with the vaginal microbiota, but it's a very small scale so far. Thank you.